So let's see what my names are here. So what does the word difference mean? We're gonna subtract at least a couple of things, maybe more. Difference of seven and n. So when they say it in that order, they want the difference of the first thing minus the second. So seven minus n. So if P people share 16 slices of pizza, how do you divvy that up? How do you know how much each person is gonna get? If there's four people, you would divide 16 by four, and each person would get four. If there was eight people, you'd divide by eight, and then each person would get two. Like 16, and we divide it by however many people there are. Okay. So what does product mean? Multiply, so the product of nine. Product of nine and something else. We're gonna multiply it by something else, right? Put a little knot like that. Okay. So the product of nine and a quantity. Okay. Uh, when when you see the word quantity, it means like a group, some stuff. Okay. So we're gonna have some stuff in here. A quantity five more than a number t. So five more would imply we're gonna do what? Operation. We're gonna add five. We're gonna add five to t. Okay. So the product of uh, nine and the quantity. Five more than a number t is less than six. And lastly, how do we check and see if a number is a solution? Something's a solution to an equation. Caleb? Right, right. You put the number in for x and see what how do you know it works? How do you know it's a solution? It's equal to 17. Okay, so a plus nine. Uh, should equal 17, and it does. 17 equals 17. So, eat the solution. Okay. That word solution is, is more significant than you think. Um, when I talk about a solution, we talk about a solution to an equation. It's a number that you plug in that makes the statement true. And the same goes for inequalities. A solution to an inequality is just a number that goes into the variable makes the statement true. If one side's bigger than the other side, and that's the way it's supposed to be, that's the solution. And when we, work, when we start talking about uh, functions, which we will uh, today, then solutions are always just these things that we can put in and that makes the statement true. Okay, whether it be an inequality or an equation, uh, if it makes it true, then it's a solution. Um, are there any questions from the quiz or from another part of the homework at all? <coughs> it's important to ask questions. It's my favorite. I quoted them all, that's why I keep it closest to me. So, if there's any questions, now's the time. Or after school is the time. Okay, we'll pass them in then. Call it good. So uh, today we're going to start, in 1.6, we're going to start talking about uh, functions. And a function is, is a really important thing in algebra. Uh, it has a really specific meaning, 
but not a difficult meaning. Um, but if we can internalize that meaning or be easily reminded of that meaning, then a lot of the rest of algebra becomes a lot simpler. So I can go back and say, remember this is a function, so it has these properties, and we can talk about it uh, pretty clearly. If I have to remind you every time what a function is, then it'll just make that process a little slower. Um, but if you have a clear understanding of what a function is, uh, then the rest of it will follow much more naturally. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to do my best to explain to you the specific properties of a function. Okay, so I like the, the uh, analogy for a function uh, that is a factory, using a factory as an analogy for a function. So a function is a simple thing. It's like a factory in that things come in on one side. This is the, the loading dock here. They, they bring things in, and then things come out. Right? There's lots of different kinds of factories in the, in the real world. They make different things. Some make tables, and some make houses, and some make salt water taffy, and they all make different things. Right? The, fact, the factories, the functions in algebra that we're going to be talking about are going to not make salt water taffy, but they're going to make numbers out of other numbers, typically. Right? That's what we're going to talk about mainly. So uh, let's say we had a, a function like x plus 7. So things go into this factory, like the number 5. Okay? And if 5 goes in, then what's going to come out? 12. Simple thing. Uh, so we have things called inputs, and the things come out. Those things are called outputs. Uh, the thing that's real specific about functions, for one, they have inputs and outputs. Inputs go to outputs. And the second thing is that every input. There's only two things about a function. Every input has one and only one output. So one thing goes in and only one thing comes out. All right. Uh, so let me show you a quick example of, of sometimes when that could possibly not happen. We could have a function, or we could have a thing that turns one number into another number, but it's not a function because it actually turns one number into two different numbers. Okay. Uh, draw a little factory up here. And we'll call it the square root of x factory. Okay. So we'll put a number in like 16. And the square root of x factory takes a number and it turns it into a number that, when multiplied by itself, will give you the original number. Okay. So, what number can multiply itself to give you 16? Four. Four. Cameron? Four. Do you have a, That's a, all it's going to say. You don't have another one? Four times four. Is there another one? Is there another number that you can multiply by itself to give 16? Be creative. What? Negative four. negative four times negative four. Does that give you 16 as well? OK. Well, the, the workers in this factory are very confused because they get 16, and they could give out four or negative four, and now like, they have to make a decision. What are they going to base this decision on? Right. So it's not a function. It's not a function. We'll cross that out. And sometimes the way we fix that is we just say, Let's just ignore the negative ones, right? You just tell the guys in the factory, don't put out negative numbers. Only positive numbers and zero. It's not positive or negative. You can do zero, right? And so we, we fix things like that from time to time, make them into functions by saying, only use this kind of output. All right. So any questions so far? Possibly have any questions. All right, so here's what we're concerned with with functions. These functions exist. 
And uh, you know, I could draw them as a picture of a factory, and I could keep uh, writing numbers and drawing arrows and then drawing more arrows with other numbers out of them. Right? That's going to take up a lot of space and a lot of time and be really uh, confusing at some point. Okay? So the thing that we do with functions is we keep track of what goes in and what comes out. Okay? So we're like this guy right here. He's supposed to look like maybe a factory worker with his hard hat and his bright, bright vest. Okay? And this guy, he's got, he's got a clipboard. Okay? And he's watching what's going in and what's coming out of this factory. There's lots of different ways that he could choose to keep track of all this stuff that's coming in and out of the factory. You follow it? He's just watching from the outside, he's just observing what the factory does. He sees something come in and he sees something go out. And he's gonna keep track of that. All right, so let's discuss. So here's this guy whose job it is to look at what goes into the factory and comes out of the factory and keep track of it. Can you think of a way you could keep track of these things, this is what goes in and, and couple it with what goes out? Yeah? From smallest to greatest. In order from smallest to greatest. What he wants to do though is, is show this number goes in and if this number goes in, this number comes out and like pair them up. So to make sure that you, this input goes with this output. Sarah? A table? A table, great, a table. So let's uh, separate this into, into several ideas, right? So this is the table, it's just, this paper's in four, four parts. So a table, so a lot of times we'll put x and y, right? And x will be what goes in, it represents input a lot of times, and y a lot of times represents output. So we could, we could write these down, like he saw all this happen, and he's keeping track, and he puts down a five and a 12, and a four and an 11, and this is a pretty efficient, <coughs> compact way of keeping track of the stuff that goes in and the stuff that comes out and how they correspond, right? Uh, we can, it's not just that fives go in and fours go in and then at some point 12s come out and 11s come out, they, they actually are grouped together. Um, What's another way? Any other ideas? A graph? Like X and Y like this? Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, that's exactly what a graph is. Okay. I'm gonna save this to the last, because this is the like the big one. It's the best one, I think. It's most efficient. Um, so we'll save that to the very, very end. We'll see a lot of other ways that we can do this, and we'll close this to the very end. Let's take what Caleb said earlier, and we'll just we'll list them from smallest to greatest, right? The things that go in, okay? And uh, I don't know. We could come over here. We could accidentally forget, and we could put uh, twelve and then eleven in, and list them in the right way. So. How could I show that five is supposed to go with 12? Yeah? Draw a diagonal arrow. Just draw an arrow. Why not? OK. There, then we point that one to there. OK. So it's called a table. Of course, we already wrote that down. This is called a mapping diagram. The word map is like a really fancy map word. I hadn't really even heard of map until uh, college. So one number maps to another one. Uh, this is used in gaming. Is anybody a big gamer here? Big gamer? Computer gamer? No, OK. Uh, well, if you're, if you're big into gaming and you use a computer uh, especially, you don't have a designated, like, controlling device, right? Like you would for a, a console, like an Xbox or something like that. Uh, so your keyboard becomes your controls, and a lot of times, uh, what is it? Uh, like 
W A S D. Yeah. They well, they're not W A S and D in the game, right? W maps to what? Forward. Moving forward. And A maps to what? Turning to the left, right? These things, these buttons map to different actions in the game. Okay? So that word mapping is used in math and in computers all the time. Okay? So mapping is is it's a fancy math word. And if you want to sound really smart in front of a math professor, you could use the word map. He'll be really impressed. Okay? Um, another way. It's you've probably seen it. Probably familiar to you. Not if I go like this, does that look familiar? Cool. Comma right there. What goes inside the parentheses? Coordinates. Coordinates. Well, though the this or what's called an ordered pair gets mapped to a graph, right? So we would put like five and twelve, and four and eleven and whatever other input-output pairs you could possibly think of. These are called ordered pairs, write that. Ordered pairs. Okay. They're called pairs, obviously, because they come in twos. <coughs> and they're ordered because the first thing's the input and the second thing's the output. Always, that's the way we write it. And it's just an agreement that we're going to make. OK. So. The reason why I left graph until last is because here is a limitation of all of these. They're, they're very discreet, which means you, can, you, you write one of them down at a time. This one, then this one, then the next one, then the next one, and you, they're just, you go from one to the other. If you want to look, you know, what happens between four and five? Well, you'd have to write all those down, four and a half, 4.25, 4.999, you'd have to write all those down. With a graph, it's a little bit uh, better. It's more continuous rather than discrete. We look at the values in between 4 and 5 and 5 and 6 and 0 and 1 and all that kind of stuff because it's all drawn in a picture. Right? And if we were the best graph drawers in the world and we had the most precise way of reading a graph, then it would tell us all the inputs and outputs for a lot of values. Okay? So we could take this guy right here. Now, how do we put that? How do we translate that into something on a graph? How, how is it? What shape represents this thing on this graph? You guys ever graphed stuff before at all? Pre algebra at all? Get a little triangle? Well, sure, you could use a triangle. Little triangle, like, or or a, would it be a big triangle? Like, how do we represent this piece of information on this graph? This would be graphs that connect you connect them to make a triangle. Yes. Hmm. Okay. Well, what shape is made is dependent on what this function does. Like, what this function does to the things that go into it. When something comes in and something goes out, that's what decides what the shape will be, right? Over a, a pattern of lots of, of different pieces of information. Okay, so here's how a graph works. This uh, axis right here, uh, we can label it the input axis. This axis right here, we can label the input axis. So this axis, what do you think it might be called? The output axis. We don't usually call them input and output, but it certainly highlights what the relationship is. These are just two number lines, right? We can graph things on a number line. Could we graph four on this horizontal number line? How would we do that? <coughs> Come on, don't be shy. Start from the, from the middle. Yeah? And we put a, a dot right there to represent four. But there's this other piece of information. Four is mapped to 11. Four is turned into 11. It's related to 11. And we want to show that on this graph. 
So we don't want to just put 4. We want to show that 4 will map to, it'll go through this function and be turned into 11. So how do we show that? Yeah? Right, so the person reading the graph, this guy right here making the graph, is saying, when I saw 4 go into this factory, this function, it came out as 11. Okay, so we'll go up 11. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, right there, okay, and that's, now that piece of information is just a tiny <coughs> little dot, what we call a point, okay, rather than a big set of parentheses, a comma, the number 4, the number 11, or a 4, an arrow, and a number 11, or a 4 and 11 on either side of this vertical line here, it's just a tiny, tiny dot, okay. That's why we like graphs, because graphs represent this information in an efficient uh, little space, a relatively small amount of space. And then if we go to five, the guy is, is, is writing on his clipboard here. He says, I saw five go in, and 12 came out. And he can just keep doing this over and over and over. And rather than having to take up all this space, where we, we kind of run out of space for many other inputs, maybe one more on each of these, on this one, he's got room for tons more. Right? He can go to three, and when three goes into this factory, what's he going to see come out? Ten. So he goes up to ten, which is, well, this is three, and that's ten. Okay. And let's say he saw one go in, what's he going to see come out? Eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh, I messed something up there. So that was ten. So we saw one go in, and eight comes out. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Right there. Okay. You can even see negative three go in there. If he sees negative three go in there, he's going to see four come out. One, two, three, four. Okay. Right now, we're in, we're in great shape. We, we have uh, discussed a lot of different ways that we can represent the inputs and outputs of a function. Um, and especially with a graph, we can, even without him watching what goes into the factory and what comes out, based on the, the, the input that he has, or the, the data that he has, he can make a guess as to what would happen if zero went in there, or negative one or negative two, right? It seems to be following a pattern. Right? And so he can say, well, I think it's pretty clear that if we keep doing this, all of the the input-output pairs are going to land on this line just like all these other points do. So far, all the points have been on this line, and I think all of the other input-output pairs, those dots are going to land on this line as well. Okay. <coughs> and the reason why I, I, I explained it this way with this analogy is oftentimes, an, an incredible amount of the time, uh, students do not get that. They don't understand what this graph is. What we do too, too often is we, we look at these equations and we say, okay, there's these graphs, and this graph's going to turn into a line, this graph's going to look like this, and this graph's going to look like that, and we concentrate on graphing them. And we miss the connection between the fact that this function takes these in and puts them out, turns them into things, and then uh, the graph represents just that. And then we notice patterns, and then we can, we can uh, pull things out of that kind of equation and graph those kinds of shapes. But we go to that too quickly. Okay. So this axis is the, it's just a number line. It's where we keep track of the x value or the input value, and this vertical one is where we keep track of the output value. Um, and all we're going to be doing today is really just concentrating on a few different ways that we can represent functions. Uh, and what a solution to a function is. Right. Um, so are there any questions so far about any of this stuff? I'm just going to write the word graph over here. Okay. Let's see. <coughs> Pardon me. Um,
thing that we need to talk about is all of the inputs, all the things that go in, all the things on this side of the factory before it goes in. Okay? All the inputs, when you collect them together in a big group, that, that group is called the domain. And there's this other thing called the range. What do you think the range is? Yeah? Hmm? All the outputs. So, so far, so far, uh, that we've kept track of at least, what's the domain of this x plus 7 function? Five and four. We have put five and four into the function, okay? And and we can say that's the domain of this function. Because those are all the things that we have put into it. And they're the only things we're gonna let go into it. But we could do that. We could restrict the domain. We we could conceivably put different numbers in there, but if I say just five and four, those are the only numbers we're gonna put in, because that's the domain. And over here, all the outputs that we have had are eleven and twelve, so the range would be eleven. And 12, those two numbers, 11 comma 12. <coughs> okay, so um, if you open a 1.6, uh, and you look at number three, so let's all look at number three. Okay, so looking at number three, um, you can see numbers three, four, and five, they're, they're just different functions, they're represented in different ways. You know, we talked about four different ways that we commonly represent functions. So in number three, what, in what way are they representing the function? What are they using? Is it a graph? It's a unit table. You write your inputs here, your outputs here, and you write them straight across from each other so you know which input goes with which output. So uh, all I want you to do is what it says there. I want you to write down the domain of the function and the range of the function. And it can be really simple. You can just write domain, range, right? Just the abbreviations. And just write down what the domain is and what the range is. So the domain is these numbers, 0, 1, 2, and 3. That's Here's a little bit more, a little bit more information, just about uh, something called a set. How would, how would you define a set? What's a set? What is that? Like a group of numbers. A group, and you know, in everyday life, a set doesn't have to be of numbers, right? You can have a set of Pokemon cards, or a set of I don't know. Well, I got Pokemon cards in the brain. I don't know why. I don't like Pokemon. Um, what? Star Wars action figures, <coughs> Lego collectible thing, yeah. right? So <coughs> when we do have a set of numbers, a group of numbers, we use specific symbols to represent, like, this is a set, all right? And that can be different from uh, an ordered pair or an integral or something like that. So if we're just saying it's a set of <coughs> these numbers, we use these brackets, these, these squiggly brackets. So if I kind of group things together, that's how we use those brackets. Like all this stuff points to here, and we kind of say something about all that. So we use these squiggly brackets, like 0, 1, 2, and 3, make up that whole set of numbers that we call the domain. And range, we use those same brackets. And, and we don't even have to write them in any order. We don't have to show that they pair up with the numbers in the domain, we could write them in any order we want. We're just saying what numbers come out of the function. So I'll just write them quasi-randomly here. So those are the numbers up there in the domain that come go into the function, and those numbers in the range are those numbers that we're just saying come out of the function. <coughs> okay, 
just to see. Yeah, Caleb? So, like, when you're writing down the sets, yeah. can you just write 0 through 3? And then now, that's different because 0 through 3 might be a little confusing. Because if you saw 0 through 3, would you think that maybe 1.5 could be in there? You wouldn't think that? Well, it's certainly open for interpretation, isn't it? Couldn't I interpret that as 1.5 being in there? So if we were to say 0 dash 3, then we'd have to say, you know, all integers from 0 to 3. And then there, somebody could ask, well, do you mean including 0 and including 3? Or just from z between 0 and 3, but not including 0? Do you see what I mean? So it's a little faster to write that. But when the sets of numbers are bigger, then we do have to get creative. We don't have to worry about that too much right now. We're going to work with small domains and small ranges when we're starting out with functions. Okay. Um, but the real, like if you were to look at y equals x plus 7 as a function, the domain of that would be any number. You can put any number in there. It doesn't have to just be 4 or 5. It could be anything. Um, but we will at times just say the input is this and the output is this. The, the, the domain is this and the range is this. So to see now if you can recall uh, the very specific meaning of a function is it's just two things. Okay. Do you remember those two things that make a function a function? Input and output. Okay, input and output, those, those are two things, but that's the first thing. Like it just it's a thing that turns input into output. Okay. There's a second thing. What's that that second thing, Caleb? Every input has only one output. Yes. So if I put something in, only one thing comes out. If two things come out, that's not a function. That's a confusing thing, okay? as we call it a relation. Um, so can we look at 6, 7, and 8 there and decide if any of those is not a function? Is there anything that's not a function? Jamie? Seven. Why is that? There's um, two outputs or one more output than it could be. You have three quarters there, and it has two outputs. Three quarters, it's mapped. It's a mapping diagram they're using. It's mapped to three, and it's mapped to five. Okay, That's not a function. Any others? How about eight? Is eight a function? If you look at seven, it goes to 13, and 21 also goes to 13. Is that okay? No? Yes or no? Who thinks it's okay for that to happen? And who thinks it's not okay for that to happen? Okay. Sounds good. Okay. So let's recall exactly what that thing says. So we'll say this is an eight. That second part of the definition of a function is that every input has one and only one output one output. That's the important thing. So, so for a function to be a function, you just have to look at one input and it only has one thing that it goes to. Okay. So now we're just asking, can two different inputs go to the same output? Okay. Well, if it still meets this condition, then it's okay. All right. So as we look at 8 and um, 7, goes to 13. So we're looking at 7. Does 7 have one and only one output? 7 itself. Does it go to more than one number? Does it go to no numbers? Is there no output? No, there, there is an output. The output is 13. And there's not more than one output. It's just 13. And then separately, we look at 21. And it goes to 13. Does 21 go to one output? And only one output? Does it have any more outputs? Does, it, does 21 have more outputs? No, it doesn't have any more outputs. There's only one output for 21. And that's what this is saying. Every input has one and only one output. Okay. It doesn't go the other way around to say that every output has to have one and only one input. That would be an even more specific kind of function called a one-to-one a -one function. Okay. Um, but we won't worry about that special kind of function right now. So 
as long as every input goes to one and only one output, it's a function, even if two inputs go to the same output. So that sounds a lot like that. The wording sounds really close. <coughs> Let's, uh, we'll stay here for uh, another minute and we'll just look at uh, a function or two that, that might come up. Here's a function that we've already talked about and we'll talk about how we write it down and what a solution would be. Um, so, do we talk about your calculating test scores? Okay. So, uh, we recently got a, a test back, it was 31 points, right? Total points was 31. Uh, and how, out of a 31 point test, how do you calculate your percentage? How do you calculate your percentage given the number that you got right? Well, what's in the top and what's in the bottom? Okay, so you take the number right, so number correct, Divided by the what? The total. The total, and we'll, we'll just we'll just call the total thirty-one. And we're, we'll assume that we know uh, how many points this test is worth. Okay. Okay. And we can say this is equal to our percentage. This is kind of messy, so we let x represent the number correct, and we let y represent the percentage. Um, Except for, is, is, is what you get out of this, is this going to be the percentage? Oh. Um, well, if this isn't the percentage, what do we have to do with it to get the percentage? What kind of number is this going to give us? A decimal, like 0.8 or 0.97. And right, these, these numbers are easy to turn into. To percentages, but how do we do that? How do we turn that number into a percentage? How do you turn 0.85 into a percentage? Multiply by 100. And I remember us doing that. So, also, we need to multiply this by 100. Okay. So, if we replace number correct with x, and let the, the percentage now uh, be represented by y, then we have a function. Do things go into this function? Can we put things in? Right. What kind of things are we putting into this function? Nathan, what's your function? What are we putting into this function? It's the number you got right, exactly right. And then what's coming out of this function? Yes, Cameron. Percent. The percent, exactly. So the number right goes in, and the percent comes out. Okay. Um. <coughs> That's good. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. If we were to put five into this function, what would come out? Probably need a calculator for this, right? Nathan? 16%. Can we get uh, a couple of decimal places? 0.12. We'll just goes on forever. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, then we'll call it percent, but we already know why it represents the percent. Okay? So that's not so good. Uh, so if we take 16.12 and on and on and on in for y, and then we put 5 in for x, we're just kind of backwards engineering this, we put 5 in for x, then will this be true? 
Will this equation be true? Yes? I should hope so. I mean, we just did that, right? We just calculated it. We just put 5 in there, and we just got 16.12 decimals forever. Uh, but what if we said is is this a solution? Is this a solution to that equation over there? No. If I for one, if I put if I put four there, what I'm supposed to get is 16.12, and I won't get it because it takes a five to get that. So if we do that math and we put a 4 in there, it's not going to work out. It's not going to be a solution. So the answer is no, it's not a solution. So just like uh, a regular equation with one variable, a solution was the number you plugged in that made the equation true or the inequality true. Uh, with a function that has two variables, uh, a function is just uh, an equation. And if you get the two numbers, x and y, and you plug them in and it makes it work, it's true, then it's a solution. If it's not true, then it's not a solution. from the function and identify the range of the function. Let's see if we can interpret all those words put together into one problem. Okay. Um, so for number 15, a lot of good stuff out there. Um, This equation itself is a function as well. Like a table, a mapping diagram, a graph, a set of ordered pairs. These are all ways to represent a function. And this equation itself is a way to represent a function. Right? It's, what's the relationship between the input and the output? For, for this one, they give us that the domain is 4, 5, 7, 8, and 12. So it's just to make a table. So there's, there's all the different ways that we can represent the input uh, paired with an output. And this way is called a table. So four goes in, and one comes out. Five, five goes in, eight point five, seven goes in, and point five, eight, seven point five, and twelve. There's the table. The table just pairs the input with the output. Input with output, input with output. Um, what's the range of this function? Yeah. It's those numbers. You write those numbers down, you group them together, and you say, this is the range. I can just put a squiggly bracket there and say, this is the range. And if, if you were to write that on a test, it would be totally acceptable. If you're just showing me that you understand what the range is and that you don't want to write those numbers down again, and that's fine. That's the range. All of the outputs collected together in one place, uh, expressed uh, clearly and concisely, that's the range. Um, one little bit about this word range, you might confuse it with another kind of range, which is unfortunate that we often make one word mean several different things. Okay? If you've ever worked with data and scatter plots and those kinds of things, you guys, have you heard the word range mean something else in math? Yes. Am I correct in saying? Okay. So that range for data would be where you take the biggest number minus the smallest number, and that's the range, right? That's not anything to do with this range. So don't confuse the two. They're not linked in any way. Uh, and 
obvious way for any obvious reason. Uh, the range in this uh, instance just means all of the outputs grouped together in one place. <coughs> okay. So now we move on to, well, unless there's a question about anything. Anything that's confusing at all? No. Okay. So 1.7. So we talked about it a little bit. The reason why we use graphs is because each of those pieces of information can be represented by a point. You just draw a little point, and that represents that input-output relationship. And you can represent so many more of those relationships in a little graph than you can writing them down individually. Three goes to four, four goes to five, and so on. Okay. Um, and just, you can, Reiterate this with this first little example here. Five, one goes to two, two goes to three, four goes to five. And just to make it completely clear, all we're doing is just in another way, in a fairly efficient way, keeping track of input versus output. Okay? So in goes one. How do I represent that one has gone into this function? How do I represent on the graph? Graph. How do you graph? Go over one. Go over one. Okay. All right. But I don't just put in a dot right there, right? I don't do that because that's not necessarily the relationship. Go up two. So, as Sarah said, we get these can be a coordinate. That ordered pair is often referred to as a coordinate of a point, one comma two. I go over one, and I go up two, and I put a point, and that represents that in this function, when one goes in, two comes out. Okay, so that guy with the clipboard has done his job by just putting that point right there, without even writing down the ordered pair. Okay, then two goes in, and we go up to three. Three comes out when two goes in, and when four goes in, five comes out. And we represented those three pairs, that those input-output pairs. Um, could we could we write an equation that would that would cause these inputs to go to these outputs? Like, what, what happens to this input to get this output? What do you do to the thing that goes in to get the thing that comes out? You multiply? Multiply by what? Huh? You add one. One plus one is two. Now, if we didn't have any other information, we covered up these last two, we could say, hey, we multiplied one by two and got two. That would work too. But then that wouldn't work in this next one. You can't multiply two by two and get three. But you can add one to one and get two, right, plus one. And you could add one to two, and you could add one to four. And so it looks like what the pattern is, take the number and add one, right? We add one to the number that you put in. What do we use to represent the number that gets put into this function? Shout it out there. Uh, what do we use to represent the number that's going to go into this function? We could use a, we could use a box. We could use a question mark. We could use a blank spot. Right? Are these the things we normally use? No, not typically. What do we use in algebra to uh, represent numbers that might change? A letter. A letter. What letter do we often use for the in? X. X a lot of times. Okay. So X plus one. We take a number, we add one, and what do we get? Depends, doesn't it? 
Depends on what x is. Right? So this output changes as well, depending on what the input is. Okay? And what, what do we usually use to represent the thing that comes out? Yeah. X is in, and y is out. So you put things into x, you get things out of y. So we just wrote a rule that will, uh, at least for the, the, the points that we have, will continue this pattern on indefinitely. It'll tell you exactly what the output should be given the input. Number five. Let's do number five in the homework exercise section. If you don't have a book, we'll write up what you to do. So it gives you this equation y equals 2x plus 2, and it tells you the domain 0, 2, 5, 7, 10. Okay. This is to graph this function. Okay. And now if the, if the domain is just those numbers, then you only are going to put those numbers in and see what comes out, and we're going to graph it. Okay, so I want to see that graph on your papers as they come around. Okay. Uh, so I saw a lot of people making tables, which is helpful. So we'll go ahead and make that. But just so it's clear that a table is not necessary. Right? We could just graph uh, immediately. The graph is another way to keep track of this input and output stuff, which are made from G stuff. Okay. So the things that go in are 0, 2, 5, 7, and 10. Okay. And so this next part is, it confused a few of you, so let's talk about it. Um, so what am I going to do with this number 0? Right. And even before that, I might just add that we're going to put it in for x. That might seem obvious, but that's what we're doing. We're going to put it in for x so it gets multiplied by 2. When that's done, then we add 2. It's just the order of operations. Right? Our order of operations, let's say, the one that we agreed to use. So we put 0 in there. 2 times 0 is 0. We add 2, and that'll give us 2. And we'll do that again. We'll move on to the number 2. When we put that looks like 12. When we put 2 into here, 2 times 2 is 4, plus 2 is 6. Then we move on to 5. 5 times 2 is 10, plus 2 is 12. 7 times 2 is 14, plus 2 is 16. Uh, 10 times 2 is 20, plus 2 is 22. It's kind of nice to know how big your range is, right? What the biggest number in the range is, what the biggest number in the domain is, so that you make it up room. Some of you ran out of room. That's all right. Um, but it's, it's nice to, to make sure you have enough room. So we can make sure that this goes all the way to 22, right? And uh, that'd be 11. So that means uh, this would be 12. And uh, you know, we can work off of this. So 1, no, not 1, but 0 goes in and 2 comes out. So that's about a 2. 0, comma, 2. and then we move over to 2 on the input and we go up to 6 so this looks like 3, 4, 5, 6 it's a little off but that's ok uh, 5, 12 3, 4, 5, comma 12 and 7, comma 16 uh, 16 that looks not right and 10, over and 22. Okay. And for now, that's good. That's it. That is the complete domain and range. Uh, represents all of the inputs with their outputs. Uh, there's no line necessary to draw through these. Okay. Uh, if we were, though, if we were to put in some numbers in between these values, uh, if we were to draw a line right here between them and they were to, to go to, say, 6, we would go up and we'd land right on that line. That's the beginnings of, of what a, a graph is. Okay. 
So if we have a point on the graph, then that pair, let's say this one, so this is 5 comma 12, that pair is a solution to that equation. What does it mean to say that this pair is a solution to that equation? Someone briefly sum that up for us. This pair, 5 comma 12, is a solution to that equation. Because How would you prove it is? Two, if you put 5 in for x, so 2 times 5 is 10 plus 2 equals y, which would be 12. Exactly. If I put this in for x and this in for y, it would be a true equation. We wouldn't get 5 equals 7. That wouldn't be false. It would be true. Okay. <coughs> well, that should do it for us. We should be able to use the rest of the time for homework unless there's a question about anything that we've talked about. You guys feel good? Confident? Okay. Yes, Sarah. Um, 1.6, can you do number 18? Sure. <coughs> Got a question about 1.6, number 18. Yeah. Um, number 18 is equal to 1.6. There's no need to be packing up right now. You have lots of time. You're just sitting around talking. Not cool. Okay, so it's only, oh, they tell us this, they tell us the domain is uh, 4, 6, 8, 12. And so make a table, we'll make a table, and then we'll identify the range. That's what else they ask us to do, and that'll be a set of numbers, so we'll use squiggly brackets. We'll use a good set of squiggly brackets. There we go. Uh, so x and y, so... When 4 goes in for x, you have to figure out what comes out for y, right? And you, you may want to write your work down here or something if you, if you don't feel comfortable doing it in your head. The thing that I do ask is that you not shy away from fractions. Don't just write it as decimals, especially when they're thirds, because if you write it as a decimal, it won't be correct. It won't be exactly right. So let's leave it as a fraction. <coughs> so we'll put 4 in there. We'll get 2 thirds. Times, right? And we'll just like, we'll make parentheses to stand for the, the place where stuff goes in. We'll take out an X, we'll put parentheses. And we can just keep putting numbers in and erasing them. Um, so 2 thirds times 4 plus another third. So we put in a 4. How do we multiply 2 thirds by 4? 4 over 1. Good. Put 4 over 1. Make it a fraction so that you can be sure. <clears throat> when you multiply them, everything's lined up right. So numerator times numerator, numerator, denominator times denominator. So 4 times 2 is 8. 3 times 1 is 3. Plus 1 third. 8 thirds plus 1 third is 9 thirds. Or what's that? 3 is the same thing. So there comes 3. All right, so then we do it again. And we get rid of 4. That's going to change. That guy right there, but it's not really going to change much else, and that'll change this answer here. Okay. So we can go 6, 6 over 1. 6 times 2 is 12. Uh, right? 12 thirds plus 1 third is 13 thirds. So 13 thirds when we put in 6. Then we're going to put in 8. And we'll get rid of this, that, and We'll get 16 thirds plus 1 third is 17 thirds. 17 thirds. And then we'll put in 12. Well, for 1, 24 thirds plus 1 third is 25 thirds. Luckily, we don't have to graph this because we're graphing things in between two. Tick marks. Uh, it's not not very accurate. So we did. We made a table, right? And so what's the last thing we have to do for number fifteen? Yeah. The range. And what is the range, Jada? That's 
right. We just write those numbers down. Yeah. I think your wrist won't cramp up by the time you're done writing that. That's it. There's the right. Anything else?